The esophagus is a fibromuscular tube approximately 25 centimeters in length that transports food from the pharynx to the stomach. Topographically, there are three distinct regions cervical, thoracic, and abdominal. The cervical esophagus extends from the pharyngoesophageal junction to the suprasternal notch and is about 4 to 5 centimeters long. At its level, the esophagus is bordered anteriorly by the trachea, posteriorly by the vertebral column. Laterally, it is bordered by the thyroid gland, which is better seen here on a posterior view. The thoracic esophagus extends from the suprasternal notch to the diaphragmatic hiatus passing posterior to the trachea, the tracheal bifurcation, and the left main stem bronchus. The abdominal esophagus extends from the diaphragmatic hiatus to the orifice of the cardia of the stomach. Let me draw here an anterior view of the esophagus to clearly show it. Here is the diaphragmatic hiatus where the abdominal segment of esophagus originates and here in the orifice of the cardia, the esophagus adjoins to stomach. In a clinical practice, sometimes the upper part of the stomach herniates into the thorax through the esophageal hiatus because of a tear or weakness in the diaphragm and causes hiatal hernia. There are two types of hiatus hernia, a sliding hiatus hernia and paraesophageal hiatus hernia. The most common cause is obesity. Hiatus hernias often result in heartburn, but may also cause chest pain or pain with eating. And also while sleeping, Stomach secretions can seep up the esophagus and into the lungs, causing chronic cough, wheezing, and even pneumonia. Diagnosis of hiatus hernia can be made either through an upper gastrointestinal barium x-ray or upper intestinal endoscopy, in which the physician visually examines the esophagus and stomach using a flexible scope while the patient is lightly sedated. Going back to the first image, where we have the thoracic esophagus, remember it runs behind the trachea. During embryological development, there can be abnormality in esophageal and tracheal development resulting in birth defect. This defect is a tracheoesophageal fistula, which is an abnormal connection in one or more places between the esophagus and the trachea. When a baby with a tracheoesophageal fistula swallows, the liquid can pass through the abnormal connection between the esophagus and a trachea. When this happens, liquid gets into the baby's lungs. This can cause pneumonia and other problems. Tracheoesophageal fistula often occurs with another birth defect known as esophageal atresia. Esophageal atresia is a birth defect in which part of the baby's esophagus is missing. Instead of forming a tube between the mouth and the stomach, the esophagus grows into separate segments that do not connect. Esophageal atresia is a lethal disease unless treated. Without a working esophagus, a baby cannot swallow or feed normally. There can be different types of defects with tracheoesophageal fistula and congenital esophageal atresia, like atresia with distal fistula, atresia with double fistula, atresia with proximal fistula, atresia without fistula, and fistula. Let's now cut a cross section of the esophagus and look at its layers. It is important to note that structurally the esophageal wall is composed of four layers innermost mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria, and adventitia. 
unlike the remainder of the gastrointestinal tract, the esophagus has no set rosa. A very common condition is gastroesophageal reflux disease. In normal digestion, the lower esophageal sphincter opens to allow food to pass into the stomach and closes to prevent food and acidic stomach juices from flowing back into the esophagus. But in some cases, when the lower esophageal sphincter is weak or relaxes inappropriately, the stomach's contents return back up into the esophagus and this is called gastroesophageal reflux. Some degree of reflux is physiologic. Physiologic reflux episodes typically occur postprandially, are short-lived, asymptomatic, and rarely occur during sleep. Pathologic reflux is associated with symptoms of mucosal injury, often including nocturnal episodes. The most common symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux in adults are heartburn, and acid regurgitation, sour regurgitation, water brush, sensation of a lump in the throat, which is called globus sensation, and frequent belching. In general, the term gastroesophageal reflux disease is applied to patients with symptoms suggestive of reflux or complications thereof, but not necessarily with esophageal inflammation. Chronic gastroesophageal reflux can continuously damage the lining of esophagus, causing mutations in the surrounding cells leading to what is metaplasia. Metaplasia means the cells change in appearance and character. This is called Barrett's esophagus. By definition, Barrett's esophagus is metaplasia of normal squamous esophageal epithelium to abnormal columnar epithelium containing type intestinal mucosa. The change from normal to pre-malignant cells that indicate Barrett's esophagus does not cause any particular symptoms. However, it is associated with these symptoms. Frequent and long-standing heartburn, dysphagia, vomiting blood, pain under the sternum where the esophagus meets the stomach, unintentional weight loss because eating is painful. Barrett's esophagus may progress and lead to adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Now let's talk about the esophageal muscles. The esophageal muscle is composed of two layers, the outer longitudinal and inner circle muscle layer. Let me draw here a diagram to show them. The longitudinal muscle of the esophagus receives fibers from an accessory muscle on each side that originates from the posterolateral aspect of the cricoid cartilage and the contralateral side of the deep portion of the cricopharyngeus muscle. As the longitudinal muscle descends, its fibers become equally distributed and completely cover the surface of the esophagus. As for circular muscle layer, we will see it if I make a window card in longitudinal muscle layer. It is important to note that the inner circular muscle layer is thinner than the outer longitudinal layer, but this relationship is reversed in all other parts of the gastrointestinal tract. The circular muscle layer provides the sequential peristaltic contraction that propels food toward the stomach. It is very important to note that the upper third of the esophagus is composed of striated muscle, whereas the lower or remaining portion is smooth muscle. This means that we have voluntary control of the upper portion of the esophagus when we swallow, but we have no control of the lower two-thirds of the esophagus. Where the esophageal striated muscles change into smooth muscle is the transitional zone where both striated and smooth muscles are present. Another important muscle, cricopharyngeus, is here. This muscle marks the transition from pharynx to esophagus. It is the lowest portion of the inferior constrictor of the pharynx and consists of a narrow band of muscle fibers that originate on each side of the posterolateral margin of the cricoid cartilage. In addition to it, 
the cricopharyngeus functions as a sphincter of the upper esophagus. Actually, we also have another sphincter in a lower part of the esophagus. Let me draw here another diagram to show you both sphincters and make a couple of points about them. The upper esophageal sphincter is here. This sphincter surrounds the upper part of the esophagus and consists of skeletal muscle, but it is not under voluntary control. The lower esophageal sphincter or gastroesophageal sphincter surrounds the lower part of the esophagus at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach here. It is also called the cardiac sphincter or cardioesophageal sphincter named from the adjacent part of the stomach, the cardia. The esophageal sphincters are functional but not anatomical, meaning that they act as a sphincter but do not have distinct thickenings like other sphincters. Under resting condition, both sphincters are closed and opening of them is triggered by the swallowing reflex. A failure of lower esophageal sphincter to relax, which can cause a sphincter to remain closed and fail to open when needed is called esophageal achalasia. Achalasia is characterized by difficulty in swallowing, regurgitation, and sometimes chest pain. Diagnosis is reached with barium swallow radiographic studies and esophageal manometry. It is also important to note that along its course, the normal esophagus has three points of constriction. Pharyngoesophageal constriction, thoracic constriction, diaphragmatic constriction. I will draw here a diagram to show them. Here are the incisor teeth, thyroid, and cricoid cartilage. Right here is cricopharyngeus. Over here is your trachea, an arch of aorta, diaphragm, and stomach. The first constriction, pharyngoesophageal constriction, is at 16 cm from the upper incisor teeth, where the esophagus commences at the cricopharyngeal sphincter. This is the narrowest portion of the esophagus and approximately corresponds to the sixth cervical vertebra. The second constriction, thoracic constriction, is at 23rd centimeter from the upper incisor teeth, where it is crossed by the aortic arch and left main bronchus. The third constriction, diaphragmatic constriction, is at 40 centimeter from the upper incisor teeth, where it pierces the diaphragm. The lower esophageal sphincter is situated at this level. These measurements are clinically important for endoscopy and endoscopic surgeries of the esophagus. It is very important to note that the lower one-third of the esophagus is drained into the superficial veins lining the esophageal mucosa, which drain into the left gastric vein, which in turn drains directly into the portal vein. In a clinical practice, Sometimes these superficial veins become distended up to 1-2 cm in diameter and causes esophageal varices. This happens as a result of portal hypertension commonly due to cirrhosis of the liver. Dilated veins of the esophagus can rupture causing bleeding. Esophageal varices are diagnosed with endoscopy.